I'm glad you all decided not to go watch the debate tonight. Instead, you just came out here to see me. So, uh, of course, we've already voted in Texas, so it really doesn't matter. But if you're, if you're on, I know spring break's next week, so if you're going back home to Florida, I guess you should have watched the debate and seen what you're going to vote for. I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, thanks for coming out here on a jury evening. And, and you know, you've not taken off for spring break yet. And so I feel very, very honored that you wanted to come talk about this subject. I understand a couple of incidents have happened on this campus. Uh, and in some ways, while, you know, while obviously we don't want these things to happen, there are, they can be opportunities. If, if done correctly, they could also make things worse. So maybe after tonight, we might be able to look at possible opportunities and, and think through some of what's happening. Let me tell you where I'm from and uh, where I come from. I know that probably most of y'all here are Christians, and, but if you're not, that's perfectly fine. I am going to present what I see as a Christian solution to, to race. Now, why am I talking about a Christian solution or a Christian answer to the issues of race? I believe that if my faith means anything, that on issues of morality is going to give me a unique perspective. This is a great engineering school. There is not a Christian perspective, I think, on engineering. But there is a Christian perspective on morality. And beyond other things, race the way it's done in the United States is a moral issue. So if that's true, I should be going towards answers that I would not get if I wasn't a Christian. And what I think I'm gonna to present tonight is what I see as some of those answers. I, I'm thinking it's probably gonna be a perspective you've not heard before. That's gonna be my guess. It may not jive with the way you are comfortable thinking about racial issues, and that's fine. And in the night, you may be, you may be mad, more mad at me for what I presented than the fact that I went to UT Austin. <laughs> that actually may be the case. But that's okay, because I hope then that that challenges you to start thinking through some things and think why you don't like it or why you do like it. So I want to introduce this perspective and just let you know, and I'll try to remember to repeat this at the end of this lecture. Uh, I can't go as much depth as I would like to, obviously, in this short period of time. I do have two books on the subject that you may want to check out. One's a Christian book written to a Christian audience. Another's an academic book. So if you're not a Christian and you rather not read a Christian book, there's an academic book. The Christian book, uh, the name of that is uh, Beyond Racial Gridlock. Uh, and the academic book is Transcending Racial Barriers. So I have two books on this that, that, that take this material and, and go more in depth, just so you know that. Okay, as, as someone who studied race and ethnicity, as a scholar in race and ethnicity, as I listen to people talk about race, I've come to the conclusion that there's certain models or paradigms that people use to discuss racial issues. Uh, what I want to do first is introduce these models in which people use to discuss racial issues. It's going to be kind of quick, because once again, I don't have the time to really go in depth, so I can't go into all the strengths and weaknesses of these models. But I think you'll start recognizing this is how people talk about race. And so before I get to what I would call a Christian model, let's look at what's already out there. All right, how do we deal with racial conflict here in the United States? The first model is what we call colorblindness. This model is when people basically say, well, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put all four models, then we'll go through them one, one at a time. Uh, colorblindness is the first model. Anglo conformity is the second one. Multiculturalism is the third one. And then white responsibility is the fourth one. So let's look at them one at a time. Colorblindness. All right, in this model, they argue, it argues that we will have racial harmony if we ignore race and forget past historical discrimination. Contrary on the advances we've made and acting in a colorblind manner is the best way to overcome racism. So when people say, look, you know, if you want to overcome race, stop talking about race. You know, don't deal, I mean, we're all humans. So let's just deal with that. When I teach my race and ethnicity class, I ask my students what race they think I am. And inevitably, some of them say, well, you're not, a, you're not any race. You're part of the human race. That is a colorblind model. That's a common model some people use as how we're going to deal with racial issues, okay? The next model, Anglo-conformity. 
And conformity encourages racial minorities to accept European American values and some racial strife is to help minorities imitate how whites have moved up the economic and social ladder. So when people talk about, you know, the way we're going to overcome race is that we got to go into these minority communities. We have these broken homes. We have to help them to get a better education. We have to help them succeed. And if they do this, then you know we'll we'll reduce the economic imbalance. As you reduce the economic imbalance, then you're going to have more peaceful race relations. This is an anglo-conformist type of model of how we deal with race relations. Okay. Next model. Multiculturalism. Multiculturalism deals with racial alienation by emphasizing the value and worth of minority cultures. Racial minority individuals and their subcultures are held in low esteem by the dominant society, so we must find worth in those individuals and culture. Now, this is a popular one on college campuses, right? We're always talking about multiculturalism and multicultural programs. We're always talking about, OK, you know, we'll, we'll celebrate Kwanzaa here, and we'll celebrate uh, you know, Chinese New Year here. And, and we're going to take these cultures that have been denigrated, and we're going to raise them up. We're going to give them honor. So, it was, so it's not this Eurocentric society. Multiculturalism, then, is a, a common way people deal with racial issues. OK. Now, if you're saying I don't fit in these models exactly, that's, that's OK. A lot of times people take bits and pieces from models. But I think that's, that this is capturing a lot of how people look at racial issues. OK, the fourth model, what I call white responsibility. This model locates racial problems totally within the majority group, culture and individuals. Racial minorities cannot be racist. Have you ever heard that? Since they lack economic and social power of white, solutions revolve around the total empowerment of racial minorities. So this is a model that says the problem is whites, white, whites have power. And because of the power whites have, they dominate our culture. They have, they have disproportionate economic educational power. When whites get their act together and people of color can have power, then we'll see an end to our racial strife. So white responsibility uh, is, is, is a model you see among a lot of activists. Uh, you'll hear this sort of talk. So these are the four models. And I know I'm rushing through it fairly fast because I want to cover a lot of material. Uh, these are the four models that I hear as a scholar of race ethnicity, people talk about on how we deal with these racial problems. Uh, most people fit in these models, or they pick and choose from these models. OK, so where do we go from here? Because obviously, we still have a lot of racial alienation. And I don't know about you, but for me, it feels like we're not making much progress. Not that we haven't made progress. I hate when people say, you know, it's like back in slavery times. Read a book. <laughs> right? We're not in slavery times. I really hate when professional athletes say that. Yes, pay me millions of dollars to play this sport. I will not complain about slavery. So we've made progress, but we seem to have stopped, right? I mean, we, 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 we've, we, we've seen a lot of good things, but things don't seem like we're moving forward. So let's look at these models, and let's see whether or not there's a better way. OK, I see these as human models. These are not models that I, I see as based within scripture, although you can pull scripture out to justify some of them. So don't, don't get me wrong. But I think that they all fail. First thing, these models tend to find some other group to blame. To blame. Do you notice the first two models were kind of blaming people of color? You know, you all are talking too much about race. Just shut up about it. Or if you all just worked hard like us whites, it'll be all OK. And then the second two models tend to blame whites. You know, you whites, you're the ones that you only give up your power or you want your culture to dominate, these models, they tend to focus on some other group to blame. And I'm going to get to this when I get to looking at a Christian perspective. But they fail to recognize that human sin impacts all of us. Now, as a Christian, I believe all of us are fallen. Only one person was perfect, and it wasn't me. Don't tell my wife I said that. So if that is true, and if I believe that, 
then when, I have inter when there's interactions with people of different races, can I believe that one racial group is perfect and the other one is not? Now, when we get to my model, you're going to see that I'm not saying that we have equal responsibility. But is it realistic to think that one group, they have nothing but goodness in their hearts, and the other group is just dark and evil? As a Christian, that doesn't seem right. It seems that's off. A whole as a Christian model was to harmonize all of us regardless of our failings. In other words, it seems to me that if we're serious about it, we have to figure out a model that takes into account the fact that we as humans, that we have a fallen sin nature, that if given a chance, that we'll take advantage of other people, even if it's not fair. In fact, as a social scientist, I can tell you that humans have an incredible ability to rationalize horrible things. So whatever solution we have has to take this into account. So I argue that the problem with all the models I just showed you is that they do not take into consideration human depravity. As a Christian, human depravity basically means that we're all fallen, that we left our own devices. While we'll do some good things, we'll also be selfish. We'll also think about ourselves and our people first. We'll also not weigh things that they don't take into consideration human depravity. Now, that's only partially true. Because what they do is they consider human depravity for certain groups. So white responsibility considers human depravity of whites. And colorblindness, in some ways, considers human depravity of people of color. You all are trying to take advantage of us. You know, just be colorblind. But they don't take into consideration human depravity of us as humans. And I believe this is why these models will fall short. Let me be a little bit more uh, specific uh, with, with each model. Colorblindness convinces whites to ignore racial issues and keep the status quo. Now, I teach race and ethnicity. The status quo in our society, even with a black president, and great things, black president, even a black president, is that European Americans have disproportionate power in our society. Income, education, status. Has it changed? Yes, it's changed. So the status quo then is a status quo where European Americans are ahead of everyone. To keep the status quo then is to keep European Americans with disproportionate power. Colorblindness shades us from seeing that. Let's just pretend, let's just pretend everything is okay. It's not, a, it's not unlike, you know, if you get in a basketball game and we know about our racial history, so things have been unfair, you have an unfair ref, and you get behind 25 points, and then the ref says, okay, I'm gonna call it fair now. You know, you're not going to feel like, okay, this is, it's cool now. He's calling it fair now. You're, you're behind 25 points. You know, you're probably going to lose. So, you know, colorblindness blinds us to this reality. And conformity convinces whites that people of color have created their own problems. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, you know, people of color don't create any of their own problems. You know, I know enough brothers and sisters who create their own problems, all right? Can we be real here, okay? But we do live in a society where there are certain structural pressures and factors so that, yes, we have some people of color who, you know, they're, they're gonna mess up, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not, no matter what the situation is, they're not doing what, the right thing. But when you live in a society where there's additional barriers, you're less likely to succeed because of those barriers. So some people of color, who would have succeeded, don't succeed, because there's additional barriers that they're overcoming. And the barriers are not overtly racist today, most of the time. It can be historical barriers. Why are Native Americans not succeeding? You live in lands that, uh, you know, that no one else wanted because they were forced there. You know where they have to live? And I can say this here, Oklahoma. <laughs> we can all agree, we hate the Oklahoma, right? You see, you learn how to connect with your audience one way or another. 
Neil told me some Aggie jokes to tell, but I'm not going to do that because I'm a nice guy, you know. <laughs> Human depravity. Convince people of color that all problems reside within the culture of the majority group. In other words, the majority group culture is the problem. Minority cultures are not a problem. Now, let's be honest. All of our cultures, from whatever race, we have problems. They're, the problems differ, but they're there. There are things about my culture as an African American that I do not like. Yet multiculturalism kind of almost idealizes minority cultures. Once again, human depravity blinds us to the failings of our own culture. Human depravity convinces people of color that they have done nothing to create racial alienation. That the racial alienation is only because of what white people do. We people of color don't do anything to create racial alienation, right? If we're honest, we know that's not true. Once again, we're going to look at responsibilities. And they're not equal, but they're there. And one thing to consider with white responsibility, if you truly believe that you can't do anything to make the situation better, then you're basically powerless. And white responsibility leads to powerless, because we have to wait for whites to get their act together. Human depravity is, creates problems within all four of these models. And because of these problems, I think it's part of why we've not been able to use them to get to where we want to go. Why is not one model one out? You know, these weaknesses to show up. What does our sin nature do? Our sin nature puts whites in a position to defend the status quo, whether it's just or not. You know, the status quo works for European Americans, so their sin nature says, hey, let's defend this, whether it's just or not. It's not about whether this is the right thing to do, but it tends to work out well for European Americans. It puts minorities in a position to constantly criticize white, whether they are right or not. There are times in which we as people of color should criticize what's happening, and there are times in which people of color play their race card. And we're just, you know, I'm just going to be honest tonight, OK? All right, there are times when people of color play their race card. Yeah? I think most people of color know when they've, there's been a person of color who blames whites when he or she is the one who's creating their own problems. Both groups do not have an incentive to care about the other group. So we get this struggle in the United States. We're struggling, struggling. And in the midst of struggle, we don't think about, all right, are we trying to negotiate with the other group? What if this is the way you ran your romantic relationships? That, you know, when you got in a romantic relationship, the only thing you wanted was to get what you could out of it. And some of you may have been in a relationship with someone like that, and that didn't last very long, hopefully. That's what we're doing in our, in our country today. Barriers are erected that keep the racial groups separate. And so we struggle, we struggle, we struggle. We stay separate. We, we make a little bit of progress, and we fall back. An incident happens, blows up again. We don't even learn from it. And that's where I think we're at today. So that's the problem. What is our, my, the Christian principles that we can overcome our sin nature? Because what is Christianity about? A big part of Christianity is, how do we overcome our sin nature? Now, we don't think about it as far as racial issues. But that's a big part of what our Christian identity is about. The question of Christianity is, how do you overcome your sin nature? Uh, and of course, we talk about being saved and things of this nature, but there's, uh, there's other principles there that I think can shed some light. I want to look at a few of these principles and, then, and try to, then try to apply it to our situation and see what sort of new model we might be able to emerge from that. So let's look at a few Bible verses. First, Nehemiah 1, 6, and 7. I confess the sins we Israelis including myself and my father's family committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servants Moses. Okay, so Nehemiah is confessing his sins, which, you know, obviously is a very important part to deal with our sin nature, we have to confess them. But I want you to notice something really key here. He confesses we Israelis, including myself and my father's family. In other words, in the United States, because we have a culture that's so built on individualism, we think about sins as something that an individual does to another individual. But Nehemiah is talking about 
we Israelis, including myself and my father's family. In other words, a corporate, corporate confession. His group has engaged in the sin. It is not just an individual sin, it is a group that has engaged in the sin. Individual sin is important and is a place to consider as our Christian walk. But there's also corporate sin that we have to consider because corporate sin has gotten us to where we're at today. Doesn't mean that you as an individual have engaged in that sin, but in some ways as a group you may have benefited from it. I'll give an example from my own life. I own a home right now. Because I own a home here in the United States of America, chances are my home is on land that was once owned by Native Americans and was not taken from them in a fair exchange. So I have benefited from a corporate sin in that nature. So it's, it's not an either or, it's a both and type of deal as we consider sin in this sort of context. Okay. Another verse, 2 Corinthians 7, 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance, it leads to salvation, it leads no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Now that's an interesting contrast, isn't it? Godly sorrow, repentance. Worldly sorrow, death. What does this mean? And, you know, I'm an amateur theologian, by the way. You know, <laughs> PhD in sociology, 10th grade in the theology. <laughs> So my interpretation is godly sorrow is, well, let me start with worldly sorrow. My interpretation of worldly sorrow is you're, you're kind of sorry you got caught. You know, yeah, you're sorry because you got caught, and if that's all your sorrow goes to, because you, you really haven't repented, you really haven't changed, it's eventually going to bring death. Godly sorrow isn't just you're sorry you got caught, you're convicted of the sin. It is something that eats at you, and you want to change. And that leads to salvation. Doesn't mean that we, you know, we're going to stop sinning because God's going to convict us of other sins. And, you know, we, we, may, we may fall because, once again, human nature. But it's different from the worldly sorrow where you're really, not, you're really not sorry, you're just sorry you got caught. Godly sorrow brings repentance. So one of the ways we deal with, with our human nature is that we have to look at the fallings and be honest with the fallings. And once we're honest, to want to change things. Not to, oh, this, that's too bad, and then move on. Okay, one more verse in this brief Bible study. Luke 17, 3 and 4. So watch yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back and says, I repent, forgive him. How many times do we not want to forgive? Because it's kind of cool to hold that over a person, right? You know, someone, sorry, and they want to work with you, but you kind of want to have that little something, something in the back so you can always slam it to them when you want to. It's not just about repentance, it's about forgiveness. And if we truly understand our human nature, we understand that sometimes we have to forgive others. And forgiveness is not just saying, all right, I forgive you, and then being, you know, having this weapon to use against them. Seven times in a day, you know, my wife can use this verse a lot with me. <laughs> I repent, forgive him. Jesus didn't say, bring it back up and, you know, add it to their list. So, how does, Christians, how does Christianity deal with sin? You know, it recognizes the sin, wants to turn away from the sin, and then, because we're all fallen as sin happens, we want to build each other up, not use it as a, as a club against others. I think, as we look at our Christian faith, it says something about the human nature the sin nature that I argue is at the root of our problems with race. So let me touch on some initial implications, and then now let me try to build this model. First, as I point out, sin is not merely an individual phenomenon 
but can be passed down through our social structures. You know, we, we're going to have to recognize this because to deal with race, if, we, if we're just going to deal with the individual stuff, we're not going to get the heart of this. All right? So we have to deal with the individual stuff and these structures. And how, you know, we have to understand how we've gotten to where we've, where we've come from. You know, when you look at a relationship at a point in time, that doesn't tell you everything about the relationship. Look at a relationship at a point in time, and the guy's very loving to the woman. He may be in a cycle of abuse. And right now, this is the time where he's trying to win her back over. Or you're looking at a relationship point in time, and he seems like he's pretty gruff. Well, maybe she really uh, misused him earlier that day. You can't look at a relationship point in time and say, OK, now I understand it. We did something to get to here. Sin is not just an individual phenomenon. It passed down through our social structures. And eventually, we're going to have to deal with that. Human depravity convinces us to hide from the effects of sin rather than to confess and confront them. Our natural inclination, and social scientists will tell you, we have a great ability to hide from our own failings. Fantastic. Confirmation bias. Look it up if you haven't heard about it. A bunch of engineers, a little social science won't hurt you. Look at confirmation bias. You'll be, you'll be better for it. Uh, we have a great ability. All of us do. So before you say, yeah, I, I know, you know, John does, why don't we look at ourselves first? You know, we, we have the ability to hide from the effects of sin rather than to confess uh, and confront them. Human depravity also convinces those mistreated to exaggerate their mistruths so they can gain from the guilty feelings of others. We've seen this in individuals, right? We've had individuals in our lives, they've had something bad happen to them, they keep exaggerating to, to, to get sympathy. That is a tendency of human depravity. Human depravity is that no one racial group will develop the answers that address the concerns of everyone. They will only concentrate on their own interests. As I pointed out in the models before, the models before concentrate on blaming someone else and then fighting for your own interests. And we'll only go so far with that. Christians have dealt with sin and human depravity with repentance and forgiveness. That is the case here as well. That repentance, forgiveness is going to be part of the case that we're going to deal with. All right. Let me, I'm going to break this down to white Christians and Christians of color real, real quickly because, you know, the final model is going to look like it's sort of this, you know, everyone's doing the same thing, but it's really not. And, you know, I'm still fleshing out exactly what it would mean. But uh, I want to break it down with white Christians and then Christians of color to think about these racial issues. <clears throat> First thing, I think white Christians must understand how they benefit from racism. Now, some of you may or may not have heard of this term, white privilege. If you've not heard of it, please Google it, look it up, uh, read about it. And I do a little exercise in my class. I have them look through white privilege and say, well, which of these are the most relevant, which of these are the least relevant? You know, because I want them to be critically thinking. Uh, but basically, white privilege talks about hidden ways whites benefit in our larger society. And I think understanding that is going to help give you more compassion in dealing with racial issues. must be willing to deal with structural injustice. Understand as, as a European American, it's not enough for you to tell a person of color, look, you know, I have friends of color, or I'm not personally racist. That's not going to be enough, OK? Uh, I'm glad. It's good. We can be cool, you know? Uh, there are structural problems that are here. And we have to take an honest look at these structural problems. Now, you've heard me up here, right? Have I been saying that people of color, all their problems come from the structural problems? Have I said that? No, OK? So, I'm, so yeah, there are some people of color there who are jerks. OK? I get that. Get beyond that. There are still structural problems out there that have to be dealt with. Add to repentance is necessary to help assure minorities that they, have, that they are an ally. In other words, are you going to work with us to try to solve this? or? Are you going to try to figure out ways in which you're not responsible? Now, th this is going to be a negotiation. It's going to be a discussion, all right? So no one group gets to have the full say. But if you come into it saying, well, 
I'm going to find out ways in which I don't really have to take full responsibility. That will be picked up. So this is where the whole concept of repentance comes in there. Remember, is it, is it a godly sorrow or is it a worldly sorrow? Is it a sorrow, oh, yeah, that's kind of bad, man, that must suck, and then move on? Or is it, that's awful? Are there ways, real ways, we can, we can change this problem? White Christians will often fear that minors will use white guilt to exploit whites. Now, uh, and we'll get to this when we talk about Christians of color, there are, there are people of color who do that. My attitude when dealing with people is assume the best until they prove otherwise. If they prove otherwise, then, then you have every right to go, okay, you know, I think that this is not what you said it to be. But assume the best. So as you deal with people of color, assume that they're not trying to exploit you. Understand that there are some that will, okay? We're being real here. There are some that will. Assume that they're not until they prove otherwise. I think if we, if we assume the best of people, we'll get further. And then if we assume the best, those people who take advantage of us will eventually figure it out. But I'd rather do that than assume the worst and miss out. And I fear we're missing out because we assume the worst. I understand your fear. We need to work through that fear. Okay, what does this mean for Christians of color? Christians of color cannot live in bitterness and anger, but rather they should help white see racism in society. Let me talk to those of you of color out right now. If you approach whites and all you are is anger and bitter, how did you like it when the last time someone approached you and all they were was anger and bitter? Were you ready to listen to them? I wasn't. Now, does this mean that you ignore racism? No. But your approach can matter. And it's not just a responsibility. Anger and bitterness also does something else. Psychologists will tell you that if you live in anger and bitter, you become depressed. Because your anger begins to eat you inside. Living in anger and bitterness is bad for you. It is not good for you. It feels good, right? Whenever we get revenge, doesn't it feel, ah, oh, yes, I got them. But ultimately, you know, you live that way in your anger all the time, and it's not healthy for you. So rather than living in anger and bitterness, and I know this gets tiring. Trust me, I know about this. But helping whites to see the resident society is a much better approach. Attitude of forgiveness is important if we're going to rebuild our relationships. What did the Bible say? Seven times. Remember, my wife puts up with me. Okay? So one of the things you have to think about is, okay, when people are really willing to work with you, are you going to you know, keep them in a position to where they're sort of hemmed in? Because we've seen this happen, and it can continue to happen. Or are you going to forgive and move forward with that? And if you forgive, you're, you, you, you're letting the club down. You can't hit them over the head again. Now, obviously, if you forgive someone, they do the same thing, then you have to forgive them again. You don't let them off the hook in that way. But you can't use that as a club to keep them in their place. Add to forgiveness is going to be important. People of color will often fear that whites will not help them overcome racism. There's a reason for this, right? Many times, whites will not help them overcome racism. I'm going to tell you what I told the whites. What was that? Assume the best to people prove otherwise. Assume the best to people prove otherwise. Now, if they prove otherwise, then they prove otherwise, and you can move on from that. But once again, I believe that if we go moving and assume the best of people, we're going to be we're going to go further than if we start off just assuming the worst. I understand your fear. I really do. But as a Christian, this is where I have to pray to help overcome that sort of fear. And I talked about the race card. You know, here, let me just give you an example of the race card, one that will be pretty clear. Uh, about 20 years ago, there was a congressman in the Chicago area. And he was about 40, I think he was about 42 years old. He was caught with a 16-year-old. Called statutory rape, even in Chicago. Uh, 
And what did he say? He said, they're coming after me because I'm black. This is racist. Now, it should not take a genius to figure out that that was not racist. That that was his failings, his shortcomings, his sin. That's an extreme example of playing a race card. Sometimes they're not that clear cut. Who can call a person of color out on playing the race card? Can whites do it? No. Now, the reason I'm harping on this point is when we as people of color allow other people of color to play the race card and get away with it, then why is it gonna stop trusting us when we tell them to talk about real racism? That's just the way it is. You, you, you don't have to lie that that is reality. If you let people play the race card and you know that it's not about racism, it's about their own shortcomings, and people realize that, they may let you get away with it at that point in time. When you come back and want to talk about real racism, they're not gonna be there for you. Whites can't confront people playing the race card. We can, and we should. And it's the right thing to do. Now, I wanna talk about what I call a mutual obligations approach. I think this is different from the models. I think it builds in the fact that we have uh, the problems of human depravity, that all of us are fallen creatures, that, uh, and that we have to compensate for that. It's not, it's not a pure, instant approach. It's gonna take a lot of work. My belief is that if, as a society, we begin to approach racial issues in this way, over time, we would actually start making progress again towards ending racial alienation. Uh, I define a mutual obligation approach like this. A Christian-based approach whereby we recognize that people of all races have a sin nature that has to be accounted for. Thus, everyone has an obligation to work towards healthy interracial communications to solve racial problems. The concepts I, I discussed, repentance, forgiveness, is a precursor to communication. And communication is how we're gonna do this. If we don't communicate, we're gonna be right where we're at. And we're gonna be in our corners, and we're gonna wait for the next incident, it's gonna come up, and we're not gonna have any tools to deal with it. The sad part is, we have incidents, we get to flare up, People will speak out, and then it dies down to the next incident. Uh, can we move forward from that? Uh, I would argue that we can through a mutual obligation approach. Okay. First thing, we have to work towards an honest, open communications with each other, even with the problem of human depravity. Because if you take note of what happens is that we don't communicate with each other. We yell at each other, but we don't listen to each other. We must enter such communication with the best of intentions and assume the other have those intentions as well and there's real evidence that they don't. And I've mentioned this before. You know, the only way we're gonna make any progress is if we assume the best and then are prepared if, if that's not there. We must make efforts to listen to others and not assume that only those of our race have all the right answers. How often, when there's a racial controversy, have you felt that the groups have listened to each other? Both groups have listened to each other. I'll be honest, not very often. In fact, I've, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of a time where I felt like, okay, there's a problem there, and both groups listen to each other and they reach a resolution. I'm hard pressed. And we need to find commonalities as well as identify differences with each other. And, you know, part of me says when we are arguing over racial issues, we only focus on where we disagree and we, we forget what we have in common. One of the things I do in order to bring, promote racial harmony in my class is my class is very hard. So students of all the races, they have a common enemy. It's me. <laughs> bringing people together at last. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna put some steps for a mutual obligation approach to show you, what, in theory, what it will look like. I wish I could say I have a great example of it happening, uh, but this is very hard stuff, and, and I don't have that great example yet. I hope in time uh, we might see this. So what, what would it mean to go through this? Let's say we have, we have a situation uh, you know, as far as happening here at, here at uh, I almost said UNT because that's where I teach, here at Texas A&M. Uh, you know, situations so, as we see in some of the other campuses across the nation. Uh, how would we uh, address it? 
And the first thing is a, a define the racial problem. What I mean by this is, you know, if the problem is some of the things that fraternities are doing that is unseemly, or the problem is there's not a recognition of some of the racism on campus, or the problem is, uh, you know, uh, the uh, campus police. Define the racial problem. Don't try to solve everything at once. We can't. Let's define the racial problem. The problem is racism. Well, what does that mean? You know, that, that there's so many dimensions to that. And, and I keep going back to the example of relationships, but if you're in a relationship and there's a problem and you try to deal all with that at once, have you ever tried to do that? You know, you get, in, you get in a discussion and you're discussing this and then, you know, she brings in this from left field and then you bring that from right field and, and you never get anywhere. You all know this is true. So let's be honest. We're not going to solve everything at once. We've tried doing that. It hasn't worked. Wouldn't it be better if we made progress rather than try to do everything at once? Define the racial problem. What problem are we trying, trying to address? You know, okay, we're, we're trying to address, you know, the policing on campus. We're trying to address some of the uh, expressions of racism on Halloween costumes. We're trying to address this. Define the problem and then stick with that problem. And don't try to solve everything at once because you're not going to solve everything at once. That's what's gotten us here. Then identify the critical core. And what I mean by this is what do we have in common? What do we have in common? We probably have more in common than we think. If the problem is policing, well, don't we have in common that we want a certain level of security on campus? I mean, we don't want to go out and feel unsafe, right? That, that's, that's a common problem. I don't care what race you are, you know, you don't want to be mugged. You know, I don't know, you know, what, Asians like to be mugged? No, no one wants to be mugged, okay? <laughs> Now, there's other things. There is a disagreement, but let's at least see where we agree first. In other words, let's build consensus rather than just coming at each other. Now, recognize the cultural or racial differences at play. We, are we agree here? Here's where we don't agree. You know, we think that the police are stereotyping our, our young black men, and this is creating a problem. Here's how they're starting to treat young black men as they are trying to keep things secure. Well, and, the other, and others may say, well, we understand, but we want to make sure that we're secure and we've had this sort of crime. What are the differences at play? What are the differences we have to take? Here's one of the reasons, here's one of the areas why I brought structural issues. Because sometimes when we discuss our differences, European Americans don't see that there's structural issues here as well as individual issues, okay? Now, does this mean that European Americans should just shut up and let the people of color decide what to do? No. But it does mean that they have to listen. Have you all ever heard of active listening? Active listening is when you can, you know, you, you tell a person what your concerns, and the other person can tell you what you said in their own words. Because until you can do that, you really have not listened. Because sometimes when we talk, the other person's talking, and what we're doing is we're forming what we're going to say, right? So recognize the differences. In fact, at this stage, what you want to do is be able to say, okay, I heard this is your concern. And the other group says, yeah, that's our concern. So if you can do that, then as you try to solve the problem, why not develop ideas that address the concerns of the racial outcome? So if you're a person of color and you're engaged in this conversation, your solution has to address the concerns of the majority group, likewise. So you can't just have a solution that just addresses your own group's problems. You have to try to think about how to address other people's problems, to reach out to other people. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to provide a solution that they're going to go, yeah, because they'll probably still feel it falls short, but there's at least the attempt to reach out to other people, rather than say, this is what we want. How can we scheme to get what we want? If that's all we're going to do, then we're just going to be where we're at. If you're, if you're happy with the racial status quo, fine. I'm not. I don't think you all are, or, 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 you, or you'd be watching the debate or going to spring break. <laughs> but if you move closer, then you have the possibility of finding a way of a solution for all. Now, why is that so important? Why, why not just see what we can get on our own? Let me just let you in on something. When you impose a solution on other people, they're going to keep fighting back against it. But if you find a solution where they buy in and say, okay, I'm not getting everything, you're not getting everything, but I'm going to buy in, 
then you're all working together for that solution. What we have done is we tried to impose our solutions, regardless of the model, on everyone else. You know, it is imposing a solution when you tell me, ignore race. You know, that's important because I can't ignore race. It is a part of my life. It's also imposing a solution when you say, the problem is whites and the power that they have. That's when you have to take away their power. That, that's, that's, that's imposing a solution. What we found solutions that may not give us everything, but in return for not getting everything, we have a solution where everyone works towards solving the problem. You know, when a solution is imposed, the group that was imposed upon, they have no incentive to make sure it works. And so what they do, they sabotage it. And then they can say, see, that was, that was what y'all want, wanted to do, and look what happened. Y'all are responsible. Think I'm, think I'm joking about that? What happened in Baltimore when the, you know, when there was the, the, the dust up over the, over the uh, was, it, was that the shooting or was that the, uh, no, he was in, he was in, the, uh, in the police van. And the police pulled back, and there's a lot more violence in the streets. What did you hear? You heard a lot of people say, see, that's your solution, and look how many people are dying in the streets. They didn't have any buy-in. We want people with buy-in. Even if we don't get everything we want, we want buy-in. Because that's how we're going to move forward. I think that's a more, I always argue that's more a Christian approach towards it, rather than sitting in our own silos and figuring out how we can get over it so forth. So, this is my suggestions on uh, a more Christian perspective. Once again, I'll just say that uh, a couple of books if you're interested in reading further about it. Uh, I know that you're broke college students for the most part, and so, you know, buy another book, is, but you know, you rather put a drill bit in your head. I get that. Uh, but if you, at one point you actually do get out here, make money, and get a job, you might actually want to buy one of these books. But if you're interested in the Christian book, uh, that one is Beyond Racial Gridlock. The academic book is Transcending Racial Barriers. Uh, so if you're interested in that further, uh, and also I understand we're going to take some questions, so if you all want to drill me and tell me how utterly ridiculous this solution is, it will be the first time someone said that. Thank you. I'll put a quick plug in for his books as well. Um, they really are good, and he does have, he, he gets the opportunity to go through some of those issues in a, in a little bit more depth, so I really would. It's, it's not just that they're his books and he's recommending them. They, they're really good books, and they are very helpful resources. Um, please feel free, there's a microphone up front. Uh, this is being recorded, so if you can come speak at the microphone, that way we'll get your question um, on, on the recording. Uh, but, but do please ask questions, or else I will ask questions. I have lots, but yours are more interesting than mine. Dr. Yancey, thanks for coming. Uh, my question is, what are some things you hear well-meaning white people say that carries a ton of racism and we're not even aware of? Okay, I'm not gonna use the term racism because whenever I use the term racism, people think Klan. And, and I've just learned from the past, what I talk about is a racialized society. Just so so you know. did I just do what I was asking about? No, 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 no. <laughs> no I, I'm explaining what I do, so. Uh, I, think I, I think I gave one, you know, uh, you know, I don't see race, for example. Because I, I know that's well-meaning, but when you don't say race, that's part of my identity. It's, it's not the most important part, okay? I'm, I'm a child of God, that's the most important part. But, you know, do you, do you see male? Yes, you see male. You see race. I mean, and so when people say, I don't see race, uh, I think that's a well-meaning statement, but it denies part of who I am. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the statements I can think of that, that whites say that, you know, uh, I know what they mean, and of course, you know, being the sort of person I am, I'm not going to say, of course you see race, you see race, you see race, you know, I'm not going to say that, but I, I kind of feel taken aback a little bit about it, uh, you know. Uh, and if I bring up a, a, an issue, a racial issue, I'm not saying you have to agree with me, but what I am saying is just listen to see where, I, where I'm coming from uh, as far as it, rather than just saying, you know, why, why you're bringing this up, it, it's not a big deal. 
uh, you know, none of us like, like that. When, when something's important to us and you know, we're in a relationship or friendship with each other and we bring it up, we should not dismiss it. Uh, and so, you know, that's something else I think I'll, I'll bring up. But those, along those lines, uh, trying to listen and be respectful and acknowledging that we live in a racialized society, I think, would be very valuable. But your question was not <laughs> offensive at all. Thank you for coming. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I am a Christian, too, so a lot of the things that you said resonate with me, and I really uh, appreciate them. Um, however, in the last few years, I've been very impressed upon by the structural aspect of racism. And um, I guess as I understand things so far with the model you've presented, I'm not yet convinced that it can address that. So I'm wondering if maybe I realize that this is a very, an answer would take you know, a whole class or a book. Yeah. But maybe some indications about what's stage one and then and then they'll be stage two because sure, the structures sure. are major things. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Here's here's how I think this model addresses social structures. Uh, the reason why we have a hard time addressing them is we argue them over them. Uh, we get in our little you know each group, one group here, one group here, and we fight over them, and nothing really happens. Uh, I think this can address social structures because we can negotiate how we can start tearing them down rather than arguing them in a way that oftentimes just reinforces them. So if we're looking at, <clears throat> and I'm not trying to pick on the whole uh, criminal justice element. In fact, it's not one I know very well, to be honest, as far as among racial issues, but it's, it's in the news today. Uh, if we're looking at you know, uh, our policing and how we can have policing that uh, is less racialized, not that we're going to get eliminated completely, that's less racialized. Uh, we, we're going to argue over it, and then you know a lot of things are going to go back to the way they were. But if we work towards a possibility of okay, here are some re here are some reforms that are going to be useful. Here are some other things we can do. How can we begin to move away from that? And if we have buy-in from people from from a lot of different groups, then I think we can start moving away. It is you're right. It's not going to happen overnight. I mean, look, if I can solve racism overnight. Would I be in College Station here right now? <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. I, I, I try to be a good Christian, but I'm greedier than that. You know, I'd, I'd be making millions of dollars somewhere else and be in Tahiti somewhere. So it's, it's not going to solve it all right. You're correct. You're totally correct. I think it's the beginning, though. I think it's the beginning. And that's, that's all I can think of for at this point. How you doing, sir? My name is Steve Miller. Hey. I graduated here in 1991. I drove two and a half hours to hear you speak. Well, you look young. 1991? <laughs> okay. That's my kids running after them. <laughs> I thought they'd make you look older. <laughs> Exercise. Okay. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm not exactly sure about the question uh, or statement. I'm, I'm going to just kind of, you know, walk this out and talk this out. Maybe it'll make sense in the end. Um, I don't think we realize as a people just how, how structural our church is and how structural our country is in terms of just segregation. Um, I'm a Democrat and I have a lot of liberal friends that really believe in racial equality, right? And, and they're sincere. But there's a problem that I have with even Democrats in that the way they live their lives is still segregated. They still go to segregated churches. They still live in segregated neighborhoods. They still have all, I call them loved ones without color, friends. Same thing with the church. I think you were right on point with, the, with what you said about sin. But how do we really get to the sin issue when if we do believe in it, we start practicing it, but then on Sunday morning, we turn around and go right back to our segregated churches. And if we go right back to our segregated churches, that, un, that un, completely undo, un, un, undoes, what is it, what are the, it reverses what we've been trying, what we've been striving for. 
So it's not harmless that we go to segregated churches and that we live completely segregated lives. At some point, we have to value each other. On Sunday morning, that's when we're our quintessential selves. And when we're our pure selves and we're separate, that's saying something, even with inside the house of God. If you've, if you've really paid attention over the last three years when all of this really started happening with police brutality, you haven't heard one single coherent <coughs> statement from the church. The church has not led on this. They have not been out front. But in effect, our politicians have become our theologians. And I think that's wrong. Men of God have taken a step back and have allowed other people to lead. Guys, I remember when I was in the fifth grade, and I'll be through here in a minute, not in the fifth grade, when I was five. I remember thinking to myself, why after, when I played with little Johnny and little Susan, could we go our separate ways after school, and why don't we worship together? I remember intimately thinking to myself that I'm inferior. That's the reason why I don't worship with people who look different from, I, from myself. And when we go to different churches today, separate as people, that's the message that we're sending, that one group of people are inferior, another group of people are superior. So my question to you is, what can we do to make Sunday morning at 11 the most integrated hour of the week instead of the most segregated hour? because that really means something. It says something. I actually have a whole lecture I could give right now on the principles of multiracial <laughs> churches, because I did research in this area. But I mean, there's a lot what you said, so I'm, I know I won't be able to get to all of it, so I'll try to get to as much as I can. Uh, what you said is correct about Sunday mornings, and when we think about it, our schools are integrated, our workplace is integrated, but we don't, I mean, we, we have to go to school. Well, my, my students, sometimes they have to go to school. Uh, we have to go to work. We have to live someplace. We can pick the church we want to be in. And yet, those churches, those institutions are, are least integrated than those other. Uh, when I did my research about 10 years ago, about 7.5% of all churches were multiracial. And we define that by <clears throat> having no group that's more than 80% of the church. So, uh, you know, I'm not talking about being multiracial as far as no, having no majority group. I'm talking about if you're, if you're a 75% white, we consider you multiracial. Less than 8% of all churches are multiracial, okay? Like I said, I could talk a long time. There's a lot of things that churches can do to become more integrated. Uh, the leadership structure, the worship style, and intentionality, thinking through their purpose, you know, I've written a book on this, One Body, One Spirit, on, you know, and, it's a, and it's not an academic book, so it you know, doesn't have standard deviation or anything like that. Uh, although you're an engineer, so you should, you should be happy about that. Uh, you know, yeah, technical stuff. Uh, you know, so, but that's books really for pastors and church leaders. So what about you all? Let me just challenge you all, just to think about this. Uh, if you go to a church that's mostly of your own group, you know, it's hard for me to ask you to stop going to your church. Why don't you, every now and then, go to a different church and one that's of a different group? And just, get to, and just go a few times, just get to know a few people. Uh, and who knows, maybe when you move on from, from College Station, because there's life after College Station, and you move somewhere else, you might, want, you might find a church of a different race. That's you choosing to be in that sort of situation. Uh, let, me just, let me just encourage you all as individuals. If you get into church leadership, uh, why don't you think about some of these issues such as church, you know, having an adverse church uh, leadership, uh, your worship style, things of this nature. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm tempted to launch into, you know, a lot of what I've, what I've gotten into, and I think that that would eat up all the rest of the time, literally. So let me just finish with this. I know I, I couldn't cover everything, uh, but I agree with you that the church, you know, we Christians are saying something when we go to churches of the oral race mostly. Uh, this is not just about 
Christians when it comes to how you live it out. Uh, a friend of mine did some very interesting research. And as you probably would, would guess, we, we sent up surveys to people, and you ask them about racial issues, the more education they have, the more toler tolerant they look. And so he looked at this, all these surveys sent out to whites, and these whites were, the more education you had, the more likely you were to say that you would send your kids to an integrated school, and you live in an integrated neighborhood. And then they used the census data to see where whites actually lived. And they found when they, and when they controlled for everything, the more educated a white person was, the less likely they were to live in an integrated neighborhood, and the less likely they were to send their kids to an integrated school. And so what does that say? Here's my interpretation of that. That education actually gives you an ability to hide from yourself what reality actually is. You can, you can convince yourself you're very tolerant. You know how to answer surveys to show you're very tolerant. But the way you live your life is not very tolerant. So I think that there's a, a big need for introspection. Uh, you know, it's great you put on a survey you know, uh, about some sort of tolerant stuff. But how are you living your life? Are you, and I'll just close with this one last, one last story. My friend, he's a sociologist, a Christian sociologist. There are a few of us out there. Uh, he, worked in, he, he worked out on campus, and of course the campus, uh, the, Christ, the sociology department on most campuses is quite progressive. And he remembered that uh, they're, they're bringing a woman in to interview for a job who was not a Christian, who was very progressive and all that stuff. And when he told, because my friend who's white actually sends his kids to a predominantly black school. And so when he uh, was talking to her about the school he, he sent his kids to, and she found it was a black area of town, uh, she said, well, I can't send my, send my kids there. Because the assumption in her mind, even though she didn't say it was, school's mostly blacks, can't be a good school. So those sort of thoughts, I think, sneak in when we don't even think about it. And so just be a little bit more introspective. That's all I'm going to ask at this point. You know, where are you going to church? Are, they, are these stereotypes sneaking in? And they sneak in, don't automatically condemn yourself, because we're all humans. You know, stereotypes of me sneaking all the time. I have stereotypes about, you know, people at Texas A&M. And I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm, over, I'm overcoming them because I'm loving you all. Uh, <laughs> but just be more introspective. And, you know, I think you, you'll put the, push the ball forward a little bit more. Thanks for your comments. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for the talk, really enjoyed it. I actually had a pretty specific question about these, uh, this third step that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed really intriguing to me, especially because I really, I really enjoy people, and I like the differences that make us who we are, and the idea of where we come from, and our background contributing to who we are and how we interact with the world. And so I was wondering if maybe you could go a little deeper into what, because I understand it conceptually, yeah. but how I, as a Christian student at Texas A&M, yeah. can really go about that in a respectful and effective way right. to learn about how those cultural and racial differences mm -hmm. exist in my own life and my own interactions. Yeah. And for each different culture and each different race and how I can both obtain that information respectfully and efficiently and then use it in my interactions with other people? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. All right, you know, when I'm presenting this, I'm thinking, you know, how, we, how we're solving problems, but how can you as an individual uh, use this? And what, what, what I would say is, you know, as you encounter people of different races, uh, this also could be a, a way of dealing with the issues that come up. For example, if that person is talking about a racial issue and you don't agree with them, you know, well, I, you know, you could, you could think about, all right, I don't agree with them, where do we agree? Let me listen to this person and let me active listening. It, depending on your relationship with them, you know, obviously if this is someone that you don't know very well, it's hard for them to ask that they listen to you. But if it's a friend, then you say, can, can you listen to where I'm coming from? You know, sort of negotiate that. And well, you may gain more understanding, and they may gain more understanding. And that's where conversations we're not having a lot today across race. What, what tends to happen, I think, and this is not true for everyone, obviously, is that we do develop friends of different races. But we stay kind of surface 
And especially when it gets to racial issues, we have no go zones. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk to this person about, you know, the school and work and maybe relationships, but, you know, the, the whole Black Lives Matter thing, I don't want to go there because, you know, I don't want to get in that argument. Obviously, not everyone is going to, you're going to be able to have that conversation with. But I guess I'm, I'm asking to take a little bit of a bold step and, and approach the conversation and see whether it's possible. So, you know, I want to understand where you're coming from on, on this. You know, and then, you know, and then as you actively listen, you know, hopefully they'll be open to see where you come from. You say, well, here's how, we're, here's how I see it. And then, you know, and then there could be more understanding, more of a conversation. So that, <coughs> excuse me, when we get to the point where we have to solve bigger problems, we already have these networks of friendships and we already have practiced how to do this. So as an individual, I think you can do that. <clears throat> Even if you can't really, you know, deal with the large racial issues that are happening on campus. So that's what I would encourage. Do you mind if I say something to her about the equation as well? Sure. I think, um, I think part of the way you framed it uh, could be wrong in that it, it seems like more curiosity. And if you're curious and you can ask people who are not friends or you loosely connected with questions like that. But I would say the best way to approach it is for all of us to have true friendship we are in dialogue with. I mean, not just true, true friendships, but friendships that are, you know, sort of on the fringe. But true friendships when you eat together, when you ride in a car together, when you spend the night together, each other's home. You know, when you truly live life together, then the answer to those questions is automatically going to come up because you're living them. But if you have to ask somebody that may be unrelated to you or friends in your lifestyle, friend in your life, then it's sort of objectifying that person because you really don't know them. But if you're living that life, the answer to those questions just automatically come out through life, through living. So I would suggest, and I don't know what type of friends that you have, but I would suggest that you immerse yourself in other friendships other than friendships that are European. Because we don't realize how segregated we are in this moment. We are segregated. We live in segregated neighborhoods. We live in segregated churches. We only have integrated schools in the rural areas of Texas, but in the, uh, the rural areas of the United States, but in the cities, in the urban areas, we're all segregated. So unless we start living a life with people who are different from us, then we're going to be forced to ask these questions, whether they live these questions because we're in constant living dialogue with each other. We have to have other people who are friends who are outside of our race that we truly, truly are genuine. Hi, um, I had a question kind of similar to hers um, and kind of related to the man about the well-intended white people questions and whatnot. Um, she asked that question as someone who is, wants to help this issue further along, but as a black person who's encountered well-intended, unintentional racism, how do you fix that when they are not willing to see what they did wrong. Like for example, um, growing up, I've heard lots of things like, um, wow, you're really pretty for a black girl, or um, you speak so well, you can't be black, or um, I would never date a black girl unless she looked like you, or she couldn't be any darker. <laughs> um, but when I confronted them and got like, like, what does that even mean? What is, like, they were like, it was a compliment, don't get offended. Like, how do you, with, how do you right. approach that yeah. without getting angry? Right. <laughs> right. <coughs> you know, our emotions are emotions, and so we're, we're gonna get angry. Understanding that if we immediately go with the anger, then it's probably gonna turn them off. That's just, that's just human nature. Having said that, uh, as I said, I think, you know, People will prove themselves not having good intentions, and at that point, you know, you can only do so much, you know, because it's in nature. Uh, if, when someone says something that is uh, off-putting or, or racialized, uh, first thing I do is I, I evaluate what sort of relationship I have with that person. You know, if it's, a, if it's an acquaintance, if it's something like that, I'm probably gonna let it go because I don't have the relationship to speak into their lives. Uh, if it's someone that is closer to me, then 
if none of that moment, at a different moment, perhaps when I've simmered, you know, cooled down a little bit, I want, I'll go back to that and try to approach them and say, you know, when you said this, I know you didn't mean anything, but here's why, you know, it, it hurt me or you know, offended me that way. Uh, you know, if, there's no guarantee that that's going to work because some people don't want to learn. It's in nature. Some people do. And if, if we could approach them in that way, a lot of times people go, I didn't realize that. And then, and then you know, we can open up that sort of dialogue. I'm not saying this is an easy thing to do, okay? Uh, but I think that's the best way to get through to it, uh, to a person who says something such as, you know, oh, you're praying for, for a black girl, you know what I mean? You know, I, I think that that's the best way to, to, to try to get through to them. That, and honestly, it'll either build your relationship closer or it'll tear it apart, you know, at that point. But I think you give it the best chance by doing something like that. So, you know, if you're angry, I understand. I mean, a comment like that, I understand why that makes you angry. I get that. Just being angry, though, is not gonna be enough in order to have a conversation. So, so you might wanna take a step back and then have that at a time. You know, just in, in any relationship, someone says something that makes you angry, that's usually not the best time to resolve the issue. But coming back and saying, here's why this hurts my feelings. And once again, if they are totally closed off at that point, you know, frustration comes when we, when we expect something from people and we can't control them. And so I expect, expect a person to act a certain way, they're not gonna act that way, and I get mad because I can't control them. Okay, you can't control that person, you know, you're just gonna have to let them go and decide what sort of level of friendship you're gonna have from that point on, whether it's gonna be there or not. And, 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 then, and then you've done all you can, and you can live with that. So that would be my suggestion on how to approach uh, when someone says something that sort of racially insensitive to us have. So I hope, I hope that helps. Hi, um, so I, I'm a student here at a and so I go to a predominantly white institution. Um, have, so, have done so for all of my life, effectively. I went to a predominantly white high school, I go to a predominantly white church, I live in a predominantly white neighborhood, and what I have found is not necessarily some type of um, racial or racialized comments towards me from within my sphere, but what I have found is it being the opposite on the outside from the black community telling me that I'm not black enough because I'm in these spheres. So what I would, what my question is, is how would you suggest trying to mend that relationship when there's no real interaction besides family, of course I have black family members, but when there's no real interaction with the black community because I'm surrounded in a predominantly white atmosphere most of, my, most of the time. Yeah, let me let me ask. Do you uh, want to develop more of a relationship with, uh, with with some of the African Americans in your life and stuff like that? Uh, I feel like I'm Dr. Phil right now talking about relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad I'm not paid like Dr. Phil. Uh, you know, the only thing with the relationships, it, you know, it's going to take time and effort. Uh, it's not something that's going to happen instantly. And so what you're going to have to do is hang out with them as well. And I'm not saying to, to stop hanging out with, with you know, your predominantly white friends, you know, because that, but to hang out with them as well and to let them get to know you. And once again, there's going to be some blacks that, you know, just like some of this young lady here, there's some whites who are not going to listen to her. And those people, you, all you can do is do the best you can and then let them go on their way. But a lot of the same stuff that I'm talking about here can apply there is, you know, as they say stuff that you find troubling, uh, you know, let the anger subside and then going back to them and say, you know, this bothered me and this is why it did. I want you to understand why what you said hurt my feelings. And, you know, some of them are going to say, oh, I didn't know that. And, and that could build your relationship together or tear it apart. So in some ways it's similar, only it's, you know, it's different individuals. But it's gonna take time, and you can't just go in there and expect them to just automatically accept you when, when, when you've not developed those friendships before. So spending time with them as well as with your white friends, I think is gonna be a, a, a key in order to build that. So I also have a question, uh, but this is related to the media. So as, as, as we all know, the media does have a 
great impact in highlighting uh, racist activities. Uh, but there's, I think there's sometimes a tendency where uh, I, people are so uh, flooded with so much racial coverage that there's a tendency to pu push it aside because they're just flooded and say, oh, I, I don't want to deal with this. Even though those issues are definitely real. Mm -hmm. So I, my question is, what role do you think the media has in the playing up of racism to not just to not, I mean, to just simply highlight the fact and not necessarily uh, cause people to just shut the whole issue down altogether. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's an interesting uh, perspective. Obviously, the, the media brings up racial issues. Uh, can they bring it up too much? Yeah, I think they can, but you know, they obviously bring it up too little too, and that's been a problem for, for, for so long. Uh, you know, I guess, you know, they say this, uh, the media does not focus in on good stories, you know. The media does not focus in on stories, you know, hey, you know, I went to, I went to school today, I came home, I wasn't hit by a car. You know, the, the media doesn't care about that. And so when good things happen, the media doesn't play it up. Uh, and I, I really think that we have to learn how to get a balance. Uh, I mean, part of it is this, the sensationalization of it. Uh, and so, uh, when a police officer actually helps an African American, that doesn't get played up. When he shoots an African American guy, that, that, that's going to make national news. You know, that's part of the imbalance that is there. Uh, and so part of us, part of our responsibility is to find more balance and not just take it for, for what it is. In our society today, with, uh, with Facebook, with everything like that, we can find the media that we want. And so one thing I would say is, you know, if you have a certain perspective, don't just go to media from just that perspective. Go to media from different perspectives. Have friends across the political, the, the religious spectrum, and get a more holistic viewpoint of what's happening. Uh, and that can help balance out some ways. Now, as to what we can do about changing the media, you know, the media, I think, will change as society changes. Uh, does it ch help shape society a little bit? But I think as society changes, if we could have more, you know, if we, if we had more honest conversations, I think that would eventually get to the media, but it's gonna take a long time, because once again, you know, they wanna see, you know, man shoot dog, not man save dog. Hi, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, how do you address individuals who I know mean well, but when they say, like, all lives matter? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, how do you address specifically for me family members that um, because I am a Christian and I do believe in Jesus Christ, they, and I'm black, um, my family has told me that I have sold out um, mm -hmm. to the white man's God. Yeah. So how do you address that type it's of It's totally person? the opposite. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, I think on the white life matters, I, I think a lot of what I've said before is applicable. Uh, talking to people why white life matters troubles you uh, in a way that they can hear, I think is very, is, is very critical. What that's going to mean is a, a give and take, because really, they're going to want to also say to you why they want to say it, so you're going to have to be able to actually listen with them as well, if we really want to have that sort of conversation. And so, you know, once again, when you're at a time, which is a good time for a conversation, so, you know, you said white lives matter. I know what, I know what you're mean. Let me tell you how I interpret that. And, and then having that sort of conversation and seeing where that conversation goes. Uh, and so I think that that would be a way. I think part of it is gonna be on, a, on an individual level a lot of times. You know, the, when this, the way this conversation happens out in a protest is not gonna do such a conversation. So you actually have an opportunity to have a conversation where someone can say, okay, I may not agree with you 100%, but I understand why All Lives Matter isn't that effective and maybe I'll come up with something else. Uh, you know, as far as the whole sold out thing, being a Christian, uh, you know, there are, there are, I can tell you that uh, the future Christian leadership is not white. Uh, I've been to conferences of young, Christian, young Christians and, and whites are a numerical minority. Christianity is not a white religion. <clears throat> it's a global religion, uh, you know, 
it's actually a racial stereotype to say Christian equals white. And so uh, how, you, how you get through to that, I mean, it just depends on the person. Uh, if some people are open to evidence, you can show, hey, you know, uh, actually, uh, if I remember correctly, even the United States, uh, oh, my percentages are off, but non-whites are more likely to be Christian than whites. So this is definitely not a white religion, it's, it's a global religion. And, uh, and so it's sort of short-sighted. Uh, so that, I'm just giving you some material uh, or think about if people want to deal, deal with that. Uh, a lot of the ways in which you, know, you get through to them is the way you get through to other people is by being in a situation where you can have this sort of conversation. And you may want to go into, you know, you, you're, you're, you're attacking part of my identity. And I don't think that's fair because, first of all, this is not a white religion. And second of all, I'm a person of color and the way I practice it, you know, that's going to be reflected in that as well. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I have two questions too, mm -hmm. uh, but the answers may overlap. We, um, we talked about some pretty big issues. So what are some of the racial problems that you think are most pressing or mm -hmm. strategic for our country? And um, what, are you, uh, what are some of the racial problems that you're most interested in as a researcher? Hmm. Boy, those are big questions. Uh, you know, I think the controversy right now is big on the, you know, uh, police policing. Uh, but I'm not sure I'm going to say that's the biggest problem. I'm, I'm just not sure that it is. Uh, I would actually say, as a Christian, I, I am disturbed by the, the our churches. But as a society, probably what I would say is a bigger problem is residential segregation. We, there's a book called American Apartheid that makes the argument that residential segregation is the linchpin to uh, poverty among African Americans. And I think the author is correct. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that we live in these different neighborhoods allows for all sorts of uh, inequalities as far as schooling, as far as economics, as far as you know, not living close to any industry. I would say that that is probably the, uh, the, the biggest problem. Uh, Research-wise, I'm not really doing a lot with race right now because I'm concentrating on anti-Christian bias in the United States, and that's been my research focus. Uh, if I was to do, do research in race, I would look at uh, the attitudes of younger generations because I believe there's a sea change happening that uh, is kind of good but kind of not so good. Uh, but I don't have any data on that. I just observe that from my own students. So that's where I would do research if I was doing research on race right now. Uh, thanks for coming in and speaking about this topic. This is something that uh, I guess I've always wondered. Uh, I've always had curious questions about. Um, so I have two questions. Um, I'll just I'll go ahead and ask them because I don't know if I can think of a better way to ask this. But growing up, um, a lot of my friends and I have used like racial stereotypes, not necessarily focused on a, on a certain race, but more focused just in general. And it's usually for like comedic purposes. Um, and so I was just wondering like, does this really, does this really serve as a, as a catalyst um, to, promote, to promote like separations within, within the races? Um, well, that's my first question. I'll, I'll let you answer that first. Uh, you know, I guess people joke about a lot of things. Uh, I, I try not to take myself too seriously. And so, you know, I joke about, you know, with my close friends, my close white friends, I, I joke about racial issues. I talk about how I can dance and play basketball and, you know, and stuff like that. I used to be able to play basketball, used to. Uh, uh, you know, I think that that's a context thing, contextualized. Here's, here's something that, uh, and this is actually a recognized difference between whites and non-whites. Non-whites tend to contextualize things more than whites do. So for whites, if something's wrong, it's always wrong. For non-whites, we contextualize it. So someone off the street making a joke about you know, me being black, that wouldn't be cool. But if I had a friend who's doing it, you know, uh, you know, joking about my dancing ability or lack thereof, and you know, I'm surprised you can't dance because you're a black man, that isn't, you know, because hey, we're friends. And so context, context is very important when you're thinking about that sort of stuff. Uh, so, so that's how I would approach that, yeah. Okay, and uh, my next question is, do you believe that 
uh, these racial issues can also be applied not only to race, but also distinctive cultures uh, that exist within the church. Um, I guess specifically one that, I guess, makes a big kind of approaches members within a church and non-members of a church. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way, uh, uh, but I don't see why I couldn't. One thing I have thought about, because when I studied multiracial churches, one thing I found out was that churches are multiracial, also tend to have a lot of economic diversity. And so, and I don't know if anyone studied this, it'd be a fascinating study, you know, so how do the wealthier members of the church relate to the less wealthier members of the church? Uh, and if there's a racial divide, that's one thing, but it's not, it's not always a clear racial divide. It could be wealthy people of color uh, and, and wealthy whites and how they relate to, to the non-wealthy. And so there could be that divide in the church. And I could see how trying to communicate and trying to learn from each other would be very valuable in that sense. Uh, I've not thought about the, the, the members and the non-members as much, but uh, it seems to me a lot of churches really are, would be interested in how people who are not members can become more comfortable so they would grow. So it seems to me that they would try to uh, have more of an understanding about that. Microphone, and then we'll be, and then we'll we'll be done with questions and answers. And well, we'll be done with formal questions and answers. Uh, my question is uh, related to the institutional problems uh, or the racial problems on an institutional level. Uh, it seems to me that um, as much as we as individuals can act in our own communities and societies, uh, there eventually are going to need to be changes in the political world. And, specifically people addressing this from a political office. And so my question is um, for, uh, with specific respect to your model, um, being a Christian model, um, in the United States we kind of have a strong sense of separation of church and state, that if you're gonna be in the state, you don't bring the church into it, uh, or at least to a limited degree. So uh, my question is two-parted. Uh, two the first one is, um, what role do you think the uh, sort of religious presuppositions of your uh, model, what role do, do they play? And second, um, do you think that there are sort of shared secular values uh, yeah. that you want to in the political office? Yeah, and that's why I did the academic book with my colleague, because I do think that you can make a, you can make a secular argument for what I'm presenting. I, I do think, I do think my, the idea came from being a Christian, but I do believe a secular argument can be made for, for approaching race in this, in this sense. Uh, you, you touch on, on issues. I don't want to leave you all depression. I think, hey, well, we all got all together, communicate, sing kumbaya, and everything's solved. But politicians are quite responsive to what people want. And so if we have better communications, and we as communities begin to decide, hey, we're going we're gonna to work towards solving this problem, and we start putting pressure on politicians, uh, most of them eventually will start saying, hey, this is what people want, let's, let's start doing this. So, once again, I think that would be an organic thing, and that's one of the reasons I want to really emphasize, I don't see this as something that we're gonna do this, start doing this, and next week we're gonna start seeing major changes. I, I would love to be able to do that. I would love to be able to do that, but, uh, you know, instant change usually does not work out very well. So, I think this is gonna be something that, as we do over time and in different places, then we begin to develop a mindset where we're finding real solutions that we've worked together on. And I think when that happens, then there's gonna be a lot of pressure on politicians to sort of do uh, what the people want. So, uh, so that's how I would see it. But once again, it's a long term, and I'm, 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 I'm not naive about that, uh, you know, uh, at all. That, but I think it has to start somewhere. Uh, and, we start, and I think if we start by saying, here's the changes, we're gonna make these right now, then all you can get is resistance and then we get where we're at. So we've got to build up some reservoir of goodwill. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the bully. I'm sorry. Play goes to the microphone stage right, and, and this is going to be the last question. All right, so I have a question um, referring to like America like as a whole. So like about like the different areas of like, uh, for example, that have in Ferguson. Um, so like people are saying like the conversation that's arising um, is 
like it's a new face of racism, basically. Um, like forgetting like the past uh, racism that's happening like back in time, that this is like a new face of like racism. Um, and my question is to you uh, is, As you, as you been a racial um, bias like researcher, like how, like how do you approach these situations um, by researching them? Um, in how do I research a situation like Ferguson? I'm sorry. Yeah, like that would be an example, but it's yeah. like many things going around in America. Uh, yeah, uh, I let me see if I take a stab at, at your question. I think you're you're asking me how how do you get how do you look at racism in today where you don't have like you know, over, over people saying that they're racist. Is that kind of what your question is? Yeah. Or, yeah. That, that actually is, is a kind of complicated problem that we have as social scientists. Because we know that, uh, we know that racial animosity exists, but there's also social pressures not to reveal it. Uh, and so how do we do research on that? Uh, I mean, there's, we, we've tried some innovative methodologies, and I say we as, as the we as social scientists, not myself. Uh, you know, I've, I've known scholars who give a list of statements and then, you know, do you, how many statements do you agree with? And then it's complicated on trying to figure out, you know, there's a Russian statement in there. And, and then there's looking at uh, what's called symbolic racism. So looking at an issue as a racial non racial component and then trying to figure out, you know, uh, how much of this is due to racism, how much of this is due to a non racial component, so, something like immigration reform. Uh, the bottom line is there's no really good answer to that at this point because uh, you know any method we use, and this is true in social sciences, and this may be different in social sciences and engineering. Uh, there is no perfect method to study a phenomenon like racism. So to some degree, it's 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 as much art as it is science. You know, trying to figure out uh, how our racial issues play a play a role in this. Uh, I wish I could give you a really great answer. Uh, but I can't because this is an ongoing tension that we have. We know that race has a role, but we can't measure it because people aren't as forthcoming about their true feelings. Uh, so we do things to, to approximate that, but we truly can't get to it. So the bottom line is, we may not know how much race is playing a role in a certain situation, but we know that it does. And so uh, that knowledge we can, we can then try to use in order to resolve the situation. But uh, I, you know, once again, uh, there, there's a bio literature trying to measure racial attitudes, and and I, you know, none of the methods have been so drop dead, you know, perfect that I feel like hey, here's how we need to do it, and it's great. You know, I'm just being honest. So I want to say first of all, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much for for a set of uh, very interesting questions. I learned a lot from your questions. I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I think, just kind of sitting in my seat and listening, one of the things that I heard repeated was um, opportunities for space and dialogue and creating real relationships and creating real relationships with, with people who, who don't look like me. Um, and there's a group in the area in particular that's been, been working to create some of those conversation groups and conversation spaces called Be the Bridge. And one of the things that I would, if, if y'all are interested in that, if y'all are interested in getting in together with um, a group of people to talk about racial relationships and talk about issues of race, um, put your name on the bottom of the, put your email address on the bottom of the card. And we'll, we'll work with them to, to get that set up. Um, obviously, if you'd like to hear more about Rashi or Christy, we would love to have you come talk about Christianity and, and the reasons for, for our faith as well, so that there are a couple of checkboxes there. Um, but if you really just want to talk about race, go ahead, go ahead and put conversations about race or something that we can recognize, and, and we'll get you connected with, with um, those folks. And we'll probably also post something on the, on the Facebook event page as well. So finally then, um, I said thank you to you, to our audience, but also I, I'd like for you to join me in saying thank you very much to Dr. Yancey for being here.